big chain ring, 60 tooth chain ring, and big cog, 24 tooth cog. Are these really noticeably more efficient than the other setups? Well, I think so. I mean, smooth, quiet, very smooth, very quiet, especially when pedaling, especially when pedaling uphill. But we're going to check into it in great detail to see why the large chain ring and the large cog are more efficient, especially on single speeds. And here we go. Okay, today's question of the day <clears throat> is our larger bicycle sprockets more efficient than smaller ones. Okay, on a bicycle the front sprocket's called the chain ring and the rear sprocket's called the cog. I don't know why. On motorcycles the front sprocket is the front sprocket, the rear sprocket's the rear sprocket. Well we'll go along with chain ring and cog. Okay. So here's a typical single speed gear setup. Uh, this happens to be a fixed gear cog. This happens to be a 45 tooth chain ring. Maybe 46 is more common. This is an 18, maybe 17 is more common. But generally this is what we have. And we're going to talk about single speeds because I think it's more significant in a single speed for reasons which will become apparent. All right, how did we arrive at the fact? That's what we're going to talk about. Now, 120 years ago, a gentleman called Archibald Sharp wrote this book, Bicycles and Tricycles. This is a, a mechanical engineering treatise on a design, keeping in mind in those days all bicycles were, well, most bicycles were single speed, fixed gear. I think Sturmy Archer was just coming in towards the late 1800s. But this is largely about frame design, drivetrain design, geometry. He goes, he uses the uh, mathematical functions, differential equations curves, analysis, statics, dynamics, aerodynamics, but we're going to zoom in on just what he has to say about cog sizes. He very early established the fact that the smallest cog that's of any practical value for a bicycle would be 14 teeth. That was his lower limit. Below then, below that number of teeth, the inefficiency starts mounting. Uh, above that, we're talking just, you know, in the upper 90s in percent efficiency. Below that, we're, we're dropping rapidly towards 90% efficiency. <clears throat> now, we all know that ever since then, well, now we're down to what, 11 cogs in a cassette? I mean, 11 teeth in the smallest cog of a cassette. So the inefficiencies have, have grown. And uh, nowhere have they grown more than this wonderful invention right here, which I call an engineering nightmare, but of course many of you uh, could not live without one of these. You couldn't possibly make one pedal stroke without this gadget, right? But look, but look at it. If 14 is a lower limit of practicality, well, what about 10? The, uh, these pulleys are 10. Not only that, but the chain, the chain comes off the cog, makes a sharp turn around a 10 tooth pulley, then goes a couple of inches, makes another sharp turn in the opposite direction around another 10 foot, 10 tooth pulley very inefficient. Not only that, and you probably won't 
notice this if you're riding a modern bike. But these things vibrate. They're noisy and they vibrate. Whenever I help someone convert a bicycle to a single speed, the first thing they tell me when they get off the test ride is, gee, it's quiet. Gee, it's smooth. And it is. You don't realize how much noise and vibration this makes. It doesn't make much, but what little it makes disappears completely. Okay, so here's the typical setup. Now, before we start looking at a larger chain ring and cog, let's see what's happening here. A chain. Here's your chain going around an 18-tooth cog, well above the 14 lower limit. Coming around, coming off of here, going around the chain ring. Now, the motion of the path of the chain Ideally, the path of a drive system, for instance, a belt and a pulley, which was used industrially for long before there were bicycles. <clears throat> a belt and pulley system is fairly, it's linear, of course, along here, and then it goes into a curvilinear path around the pulley. Now, well, don't we have this with a chain and car? No. We don't. This is not curvilinear. Why? Because this is not round. This is polygon shaped. Polygon, a multi sided figure. It's called a polygon. And the path the chain takes, or, or the, the, the polygon that the path travels along, is called a pitch polygon because the polygon, the side of the polygon, each side is the length of a pitch. So that's this is the pitch polygon, a polygon with the side equal to the pitch of the chain. So this means that when the chain hits a tooth, it's easier to see down here, when the chain hits a tooth, it curves. It kind of jerks from one, from a straight line, drops down into the tooth, and it's not curvilinear either, it's Herky-jerky is why I like to put it. So these are nonlinearities, and nonlinearities in mechanical motion cause uh, drops in efficiency. Now, how much is the drop in efficiency? Well, you know, people say, well, chain drives are 99% efficient. Well, they could be. They could be, but they're not. It turns out that... Charlie, I mean Archie, <laughs> Archie went some calculations and he's figuring, well, it's in the 90s. It's in the 90s, but it gets to be low 90s when you have a smaller cog than 14. Well, how about 10, how about 10 tooth bullies? Charlie, or keep calling him Charlie, Archie. Archie didn't anticipate this Lucky for him, although he lived until the 1930s when, of course, these were, these were around in the 1930s. So, according to Archie's calculations, larger, just the larger the sprockets, chain ring or con, the more efficient or the closer to ideal efficiency, you know, 100%, you get. So, let's take a look at improving this situation here. How much can we improve this? Well, it so happens that this cog and this chain ring together have the same gear inches as this setup, exactly roughly 67 gear inches, which you might think a little on the low side for a single speed. It is, however, in my case, I need it because if I want to get on my bicycle to go to the grocery store for a quart of milk, that involves a 1,000 foot elevation change for me, and I don't own a car. So every quart of milk I get <laughs> involves a 1,000 foot elevation change. 
So this is a practical size. This is 60, and this is 24. And look at the difference. Look at that difference. So you can see that the pitch polygon path of the chain will be much higher, much larger, slower, it'll curve less, and the losses will be less. So, how much less? Well, it turns out that, that uh, this system here, not including using a derailleur, this system here can be as lossy as 10%. In other words, this could be 90% efficiency. This could be higher 90s, 97, 98. Is that an appreciable amount? Yes, it is. Now, maybe not to, uh, to a machine that's measuring watts, you know, to a machine that's measuring efficiency, drive efficiency, but to a human being pushing pedals with their leg muscles, they can certainly feel that 5 to 10 percent. Absolutely. I know I can. I mean, I've made the trip up and down my hill, 1,000 foot elevation change, over 10,000 times. And I've taken bicycles that I've ridden with, say, 12 to 18 speeds and, and cut them down to one speed. And uh, I can feel the difference. Yeah, for, uh, for a given number of gear inches in a multi-speed bike compared directly with a single speed setup of the same gear inches, the single speed flies up the hill. Okay, so you're wondering... Has this been, do we have any hard numbers for this? Well, here is the spring 2000 edition of the Technical Journal of the International Human Powered Vehicle Association, featuring on the list of articles, the efficiency of bicycle chain drives. So we're gonna take a look at that. We're gonna scroll down to the conclusions abstract and the illustration of the test setup. Now, the bottom line in the abstract is, and I quote, the results of this study indicate that chain tension and sprocket size primarily determine drive, chain drive efficiency. Now, they mention chain tension. Well, in a derailleur bike, chain tension is actually very little. The chain, the bottom run of the chain is flopping around, banging on the chain stay. It's just, uh, it's just there with minimum amount of tension exerted by the spring in the derailleur to keep the chain from falling off the pulleys and the cogs and the freewheel, and the uh, chain ring. However, in a single speed bike, the chain can be adjusted for a lot more tension, much closer to the optimum tension for peak efficiency. Okay, now notice on the illustration, the test setup is driven by an electric motor, not a human muscle. The electric motor delivers a constant torque. The human muscle delivers a pulsating torque, varies considerably depending on where you are on the stroke. Even if you've got clipless pedals, you can't really pull up with the same force as you can push down, which has been shown over and over again. This makes a difference. Okay, and also look at the lower right corner of the illustration and you'll see a cassette and a derailleur. So their numbers include the inefficiencies, the losses due to the derailleur. So if they're talking about five to ten percent efficiency loss with small chain rings, you can add another several percent 
efficiency loss due to the derailleur. And of course, they're assuming zero offset. In other words, the chain line is perfect. As you can see from the illustration, in real life, it's far from perfect. As soon as you deviate to one side of the cassette or the other, your chain line goes to hell. But there we have it. The, uh, their bottom line is chain tension and sprocket size.